Turn with us to the book of Revelation out of the second chapter. And we're going to start at the first verse. And you just bear with me for a few minutes and I'll be right out of your way. I just got to be real with you tonight. Sometimes we're in those seasons where we can't see the good in everything yet. We can't feel the good in everything yet, but yet we know that good is coming. And I'm excited for that. Sometimes we can't understand when it's happening. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know where it's going to happen, but we know something's going to happen. Do you believe that tonight? I know a lot of us are standing in need, and I just want to remind you to be faithful. This is just one of those times that God's looking for faithfulness. Sometimes we don't have to do a great big lot to be faithful. If we'll be faithful, it's more effective than what our feelings could ever do. Sometimes we just got to put our feet down and say, Lord, I'm here tonight for you. I'm here to give you glory in my life. And if you can do that, friend, you're going to move mountains. Now let's begin. To the angel of the church of Ephesus writes, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now let's hold right there for a minute. When you read it up to that point, it sounds pretty good, don't it? When you read about the kind of people that know who they are, know what they're to do, know how they labor, that they've got patience, that they can bear things, know that they don't need to bear evil, that sounds pretty good, don't it? That sounds like the kind of church we want to be, right? And I read this, and in most of the points in my life, I look and I can identify, Lord, this part of my life is all yours. Lord, you've got my praise. Lord, you've got my trials. You've got my tribulations. You've got my issues. You've got my troubles. But yet, read it verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Most people read that part, but I want to add on a little bit more to this. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, my Lord, my Lord, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. When we think about what we love, it's a very personal thing. When we think about what matters, it's something that even if everybody else doesn't care, we still hold value to it. Some of you have families that you love. Some of you have friends that you love. Some of you have things that you love. Church that you love. Possessions, a home that you love. A history in that home that you love. But I'm here to tell you, not everything that we choose to love is always for our good. Not everything that we align our love with fully represents who God is. 
If it weren't the case that that was it, I believe this scripture would read a little bit differently than we find here. But there's something that God has showed me out of this. You see, when I love something, then I'm willing to defend it. And if it's important to me, then I'll stand up for it. And if there is something that tries to come against what I love, I therefore hate or do not possess the love for what would come against what I love. But if it is not God, if it does not represent God, and if it's not God first in us, then the things that could be loved could also be sin. And what I want to talk to you tonight is not the things that you love that God doesn't mind. But what I want to talk about tonight are maybe the things that we defend, that we care about, that maybe God wants to help us with in our life. Because it's not just that we get away with this tolerance of our faults. There's a very strict warning in this passage that reminds us that if we're not going to let go of what produces sin, that if we continue to love which produces sin, therefore we lose what it calls our lampstand or our ability to shine. Now we all love many things, but if God isn't the very first thing that we love, then I find that our lampstands are getting knocked over far more than they should. I hope one day we stand with a true integrity and backbone that represents the kind of people that we are. But above every standard, above every scripture, above every doctrine, above everything we've ever grown up to know, if we are not putting God in front of our family, if we're not putting God in front of our feelings, if we're not putting God in front of our church, if we're not putting God in front of our traditions then one day the things that we love will be the things that turn us to be the kind of person that would hate our God he said you'd only serve one or two masters that you'll love one and you'll hate the other but brother I could never be the kind of person that hates God and be a Christian at the same time but I'm here to tell you to be a Christian means that you're Christ like and to be Christ like means that you love the Father but if we don't walk in the love of Christ then we're not loving God so you can say that you're a Christian you can say you go to church but if your love is not there watch out for your lampstand my friend now, I'm just going to talk about my life because some of you may be thinking oh nothing could ever go wrong with me but I'm here to tell you it can I had a falling away in my life once. It was before I ever got solidified, before I started preaching or evangelizing. You see, there was still more work to do in here. How many of you will admit, there's always more room for improvement? <laughs> I had some more work to do. You see, a long time ago, before I ever accepted it, I knew I was called to do what I'm doing today. But I loved a lot of things that did not represent what I was called to do. Now, God saw these things in me, and guess what? I had to have a few lampshades knocked over in my life. I went from being enrolled in college to getting to the point where I was no longer there. I had someone that I loved, but I messed it up and lost it. I had a job, but quit going and no longer had a job. That means also that I didn't have income. And with no income comes no ability to pay for anything. I began to lose what I drove, what I had in my money, what I had in the love that I had in my life, what I had in my education. And it was becoming very clear to me then that everything that I was loving in my life before God, I was beginning to lose. So you better take this warning to the bank. If you want 
want a little heart preaching, here it is tonight. Anything that you love more than God, no matter if it's who you love the most in this life, what you own the most in this life, if it's before Him, it's subject to be lost. Because until we give Him glory for what we love, then we might lose exactly what we cherish. Amen. Amen. Maybe you've not lost some things yet. But when we spend a lot of time loving ourselves, I love me. I love me some me. I don't know about you if you love me or not. I love me some me. I love me some me so much sometimes that I forget to pray. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just me. I love me some me so much sometimes that I don't have time to get into the Scripture and read something that could help keep me disciplined. Is it just me tonight? No, we all have been there, right? Here's what I'm getting at. It's very easy to see in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fell. Did it say to forget? No, that's what captivates me. It says to remember. If there has been something in our life that has took us away from God, though He cast your sin in the sea of forgetfulness, He don't want you to forget what you come from. I feel that all over me. Hallelujah. If we don't forget where we come from, maybe we'll be a little bit more of a humble people. Amen. If we remember where we come from when we were disobedient to God, maybe we'll obey Him a little bit more. If we remember the kind of people that we were when we loved everybody before we just loved ourselves all the time, we'd be a little bit more of a loving church. Can I get an amen tonight? If we remember what it was like to be Spirit-filled, if we remember what it was like to be the kind of person that loved God above ourselves, maybe we'd just be that kind of person. Now, I'll tell you this much. I'm so thankful for who I have in my life. But she needs reassurance that I love her. Right? Can I give a couple more examples? You love your favorite restaurant, right? But if you never go there to eat, they're going to go out of business. So you got to show them some love by paying for a plate, right? If you're a Ford truck man... You better buy a Ford truck for Ford to stay around. Some of you might be Chevy fans. If you like a Chevy, you're going to go buy a Chevy, right? If you love your kids, even like in my case, if they were the worst in sports ever, you're still going to cheer for them when they get the ball. You hear what I'm saying? If you know somebody that's trying their best in something, and even when they don't do that great, you're still going to support them regardless. Isn't it amazing to me when we think about the things that we love that we'll look over much to continue to show our devotion to what we love. Do you get what I'm saying? So I'm going to be real plain. Do we love each other tonight enough to look past who we know about each other, what we understand about one another, to accomplish the greater good, to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know where I'm going with this? Can we remember the nights where we didn't like the service enough to love God more and to do more than we did the last time? I'm going to tell you this right now. God's got more in store for you if you'll just remember the nights that you dreaded coming to church. Maybe it'll make you come in the door and have a greater appreciation for what you've got. It's a, and I just can't, I can't get away from that. I was probably one of the worst basketball players ever. If the phrase worst basketball player ever was in the dictionary, I'd be in the top ten. I was a bench warmer for the most part. I couldn't even make a layup. On my best day I might make a shot or two that might get me in the last two minutes of the game but my parents took me to every practice you hear what I'm telling you they took me to every game sometimes the games were far away sometimes it made them have to take off work to get me there but they made the sacrifice to show their love 
Hallelujah. The Lord calls for us to come in and give that sacrifice of praise. It may not be easy. It may not be convenient. But it's well worth the investment because you're not investing in some God that cannot produce for you. You're not investing in some God that cannot defeat demons. You're not investing in some God that can't heal cancer. When you put your praise in the mix and you give yourself up and love God the way that He deserves to be loved you invoke the power of a God that will stand up for you and provide for you you see God is a jealous God he's not just on the present he's not just a God who hears but he is a jealous God in any relationship when love is given over time the thing which is loved, that loses love, therefore becomes jealous, right? How many of you have ever had friends that stopped being your friends and you got jealous when they were friends with other friends? Or maybe you loved that person, they came to your church and sang, but then God moved them on and all of a sudden you just couldn't get behind the song they sang. Nobody's going to say amen to that. It's all right, it's all right. Oh, I love that one preacher when he came to 13th Street all the time, but he went somewhere else, and oh, he's just went down. Has he really? Probably not. Or is it our love that changes, right? This is what God's trying to teach me in my life, in my everyday life. The things that you identify with that you love the most will be the things that define you. Now, let me tell you something. Just as much as God is a jealous God, the devil is a jealous devil. And any time that you just remotely resemble a person that's going to love God more, he's going to try to come after you because he is a very jealous presence. You see, he was banished out of heaven because he was jealous of the glory of God. Because people wanted to love God more than what he was able to do when he led worship. Now I'm here to tell you there are people in this world that will want your love that will never love you. And the devil is that kind of presence. The devil wants your love, but he's never going to love you. He'll want you to try drugs and alcohol, but never giving you any life or any blessings. And I spent 10 years of my life throwing it away, loving things that never loved me back. And one day I finally got sick and tired of living my life without a car, sick and tired of living my life without a job, sick and tired of living my life without somebody to love. And I finally made up my mind, well, brother, did you join rehab? No. Brother, did you go back to try to get your education? No. Brother, what did you do? I finally came to a God that when He forgave me, began to show His love for me when I began to love Him above everything that I loved. We can be patient and still love the wrong things. Did you know that? We can be devout, faithful, attending Christians and still have things that get in the way of our relationship with God. I'm not going to ask you to get out a notepad and a pen right now, but I want you to open that up in your mind right now. I want you to think of at least two to three things that you would just about give your life for. Maybe it's a person that's come to mind. Maybe it's children that's come to mind. Maybe it's things that you're proud of that's come to mind. You'd lay your life on the line for your reputation, right? You lay your life on the line for your integrity. How long have we spent our lives fighting to love things that never love us back? You know, I spent a long time Loving popularity. But you know what? Popularity never loved me back. It's temporary. You can feel like you're in the it crowd. And it'll feel like love. But 
in just a moment, everything changes. So here's some things I've learned in the past 10 years since I've been sober. Number one, there is no one that can love me more than God. Nobody. And when everything else doesn't love me, I still have him. You hear me tonight? When all else fails you, I want to remind you, you still have a father that loves you. Number two, I love God because he first loved me. When you first love other people, you're loving them as God loved you. When you forgive them without them having to ask for your forgiveness, that's you showing godliness. When you give to their need before they beg you for help, that's godliness. To be godly is to be as God. To be God is to provide in a way that people could not make for themselves. Divinely. Let me tell you something. You've got more than you think you do. And there's people all over this nation today. They don't need a church that's cool. They don't need a church that's hip. They need a church that remembers their first love. That's what I'm learning. They don't need me to love the way I look. They don't need me to love the way I sound. People don't need to love a form and a fashion. They need to feel loved because we love them. And I feel like so many things come up. And I'm, I'm for first of all, I'm not laying blame on anyone. Because I understand that life comes and we get up with good intentions, but things just begin to start happening. They just start happening. And it's how we handle with what happens that shows that we love God. But I'm here to tell you, I've been in that predicament. I've been in the place where people that I thought had my back and my job didn't have it then and I was discouraged. Or people that I was expecting to step up and help me when I was going through something, they weren't there. And I, and I was heartbroken. Have you ever been there? I've been heartbroken before. Expecting people to come and nobody show up. And you get in those predicaments where you're still called upon to do good. But you have so many things standing in the way. And I fear that that's the world that we are starting to become in the church. We have too many things that are standing in the way. And our love is being misused. God never wanted you to love the kind of person that you are that includes depression. Whether you want to say it or not, that's okay. I'm going to say it for this old guy. If we're not too careful, we'll get back to love and sin again. Some of you may have just took two steps back on that. That's okay. I'll take two steps forward. Get back right where you are. Brother, I'm, I'm not going after sin. I don't love sin. Well, what rules you? What rules you? In other words, what do you surrender to that has authority? You surrender to something that has authority when you're afraid. But if you have love from something... You don't fear it. Right? If you have a God that loves you in spite of your problems, then you're not afraid that God's going to help you. And if you've got a devil that's trying to, to show you false forms of love, and we give in to those loves, then God cannot step in the way that He could if you still yet would give Him your love. All of us at some point in our life have had a falling away. Let's just put it out there. Let's just say amen and admit it. We've all had a moment of falling away. We've all been fed up before. We've all felt left behind before. We've all felt unloved. And you know what? You didn't have to stop going to church to feel that way. 
Did you? You didn't have to stop singing in the choir to feel that way. You didn't even have to stop preaching to feel that way. The devil is so cunning. If a third turned with him, then it's not too far to say that if we stand in the wrong kind of love, there'll be some that go with you. And then we end up taking a part of ourselves away from our potential. The devil doesn't have to take all of you away to win. He just has to get your love away from the things that matter. Have you ever noticed that? We love God, right? We want to do great for God, but what keeps us from loving Him like we love our food or love television or love going on vacation? I'll tell you what it is. It's the things that try to draw our love away. Bitterness, hatefulness, envy, strife, jealousies, Malice, wrath. The Bible talks about all of these qualities that come to draw your love towards it. Because if your love is in malice, if you thrive in chaos, and what I mean by that is, if you feel better about saying negative things than you do saying positive things, then your love is away from godly things. Amen, oh me, or ouch. Which one do you want? I'm going to go with ouch. Because there's been some times I've said some things and I felt pretty good in the moment, but I realized I hurt somebody. Or there's been some times that God really needed me to step up and love everybody in spite of my problems and I didn't. And people would walk out feeling left behind. And truthfully, 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 the devil isn't that powerful. You know that? And there's a whole world that could be saved today that the devil can't do nothing about. You know the only reason that people feel left behind? Do you want to know? Because we're not loving them. You love us. You ever heard that expression, my four and no more? Not that I'm against people that have four. It's an expression. My four and no more. Or I'm just concerned about me. We've got a culture today that says to love yourself the way that you want to be loved. And to love others the way you want to love. But God was pretty clear that sin could not dwell with innocence. He's very clear that bitterness can't sit in the same fountain as sweet He's very clear that love and hate will not dwell in the same temple. Light and darkness will have no fellowship. And let me tell you something. Obedience will not live with disobedience. We're either going to come in and be active for God or we're going to have this mix of lukewarmness. I tell you what, you can get scalding hot water. And have a spoonful. But if you've got an entire pot full of ice cold water. You think you're going to feel the heat? Now one or two people can come in here and have a good time. But does that mean overall we're being effective together? No. Come on and help me tonight. If, you, if you're feeling this tonight, help me for a minute. We can have a, a few that come in and get on fire and get hot for God. But God called us to be as one. That means no, even if I did the best that I could, if you're cold and indifferent, there's no agreement. And if there's no agreement, there is no unity. And if there is no unity, there cannot be a, a, an anointing to bless in the atmosphere. And if we're in this place where there is no unity, then the door is open for the devil. Hallelujah. I feel this all over me right now. You say that you love God, but he said there'd be no evidence of it until you love your neighbor as you love yourself.
What is your neighbor? Is it just a person? It could be anybody. Lost, saved, your enemy, just those that are close to you. Your neighbor is someone that's nearby. What is that really telling us? To love your neighbor as yourself means you love those co-workers that give you a hard time. Woo! You love that relative that you just dread going to Thanksgiving with anyway. Woo! Hallelujah. That one that you stand on the other side of the corner of the family reunion, you love them anyway. Hallelujah. Those people that say you're, they're your friends but are just looking to spite you, you love them anyway. To have a heart that's after God truly says, I love God greater than what I love here. I'll say this and I'll come to a close. When you go out of here tonight, I don't want you to do 100 jumping jacks or 50 push-ups after that or any burpees or squats. I'm not asking you to do above what you're able to do. So what I ask you to do right now, I really hope that you do. I want you to think about the top three things that are bothering you right now. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you realize that when you keep the company of something, that you're welcoming it? Until we resist the things that bother us, are we displaying that we despise it or hate it? People have taken hate into be something that is so ugly. But hate is simply the opposite of love. To love God is to hate or rebuke your enemy. To be faithful for your need is to rebuke your doubt. You'll only do one of two things. And isn't it wonderful that God gave us that ability of choice by design? He didn't leave us any gray area. And truthfully, there is no middle of the fence. No one I've ever saw sit on the middle of the fence was ever comfortable. Especially if there's barbed wire on one side. And I must admit, I've made that mistake a couple times in my life. One side's going to be good. And the other's going to hurt when you try to cross. And that's how sin is. It's the barbed wire that you don't think about. It's the thing that happens that hurts you without you even realizing it's already happened. So what does the scripture tell us about returning to our first love? It's the most important part of this tonight. It's one word. It starts with an R. Ends with a T. It has a pen in the middle. To repent or to turn around. If there's anything that's bothering you in your life, you want real instruction tonight, turn from it. Turn from it. If you're bitter about something or someone, turn from how you feel. You received that? It's getting real quiet right now. There's something that is keeping you from obeying God. Turn from it and let God have a chance. Well, they just don't receive me. Turn from that feeling in the name of Jesus. My Lord and my God, Doris, if people would turn away from the things that hold them down, they just might become the greatness that God has called them to be from even the beginning of their birth. I'm just now learning. Can you believe that? Wait, brother preacher, what do you mean you're just learning? You're just figuring this out? How long have you been preaching? Probably too long. I think I'm, I've preached everything I'm ever going to preach. I'm just repeating myself at this point. But even though I've preached everything I'll probably ever say, guess what? I'm still learning. And sometimes we need to go back around the bend and appreciate the good we have and learn from the mistakes we've made in order to become the person that God is calling us to be. Because I'm telling you, you may not feel it, but you're loved. And if we don't accomplish anything else as a church, they don't need to walk out and say, wow, that's a talented singing. 
They don't need to just walk out and say, wow, they have great preaching. People need to go out and feel like they're loved again. You want to increase your numbers at your church? Love people. Make them feel loved like you want to be. You'll go the extra mile for them then. I'll say this, just because I don't want to make it sound like that I never had at least one good moment. There was a game, and it was, we finally got it on tape, believe it or not. There was a game where I finally got to be put in at the end. They had ran out of players because everybody had fouled out. So I finally got to be in the game. I'm just going to tell you like it is. And the coach said, okay, we're going to run this play, Jared. You just stand over here in the corner. It's like, we don't want you to do anything. You just stand over here. I'll never forget this as long as I live. So the play starts. They throw it out at half court. All five realize I'm not going to be the one with the ball because I've not been in the game. So I'm just standing in the corner. So they're throwing the ball around. Nobody can get a shot off. Time's ticking. Ten. Nine. Throwing it around. There's no shot. And I remember seeing the ball head my way. And I thought to myself in my mind, there must be somebody behind me. (laughs) Because I knew sure as the world they weren't throwing that to me. And I remember getting that. And the only thing I could hear in the background was, shoot! And I'm pretty sure out of all of those people, the one that was yelling the loudest was my mother. I'm telling you, you could have heard her in a crowd of a thousand over everybody else that day. And even though I wasn't the greatest, I'm telling you, when I threw that up by a miracle of heaven, I guess, it went in. And we won. But, you know, I forgot about who was around me that gave me high fives that day. I forgot what number I wore on my jersey. I for even have forgot what team we were playing. But you know what I've not forgot? That person that had my back. That one that yelled for me. <laughs> Let me tell you, there's a God in heaven. When you feel like no one sees you, knows you, understands you. Man, I feel the anointing of God all over me right now. When you feel like you're standing in the corner and nobody understands you, let me tell you, when you step up to do what you're called to do, you're going to hear God, you're going to hear Him above everybody else. You're going to feel Him above everybody else. You're going to know the mountains are moved above everything you're dealing with because that's the kind of God you've got. He said He'd be with you all the way, even until the end, friend. Don't give up yet because God's going to shine above the rest. I'll never forget that. And then I realized I was a winner. I never got to be in all the other games, but I realized I was a winner. Was it because I got to play and got to throw up the shot? No. But I was a winner because I felt loved. And that's what we need for our loss today. We need to make them feel like We love them and they're winners and life isn't over yet and there's hope for them. If we do nothing else in this building but make people feel loved, guess what? You're doing the will of God. I love you, church. Think about that tonight. Think about moments where you can love people and make them feel like that.